Good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, we are to teach and admonish one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what we've done this morning. Tommy started off with a song, sort of a folk song. Uh, the uh, Come to the Church in the Valley by the Wildwood. And, and you know what that song's about. It's about a fellow going to church where he, he went when he was a child and it just meant so much to him. And he's thinking back on that sweet little church where he used to attend and, uh, and the lessons he learned there. So there's some spiritual sentiments in that song. I'll, I'll wing my way to mansions of light. You like that verse? Now, now that's not, we, we don't think that, uh, that uh, you get angel's wings when you die. That's not what, what we believe. We, we know the Bible doesn't teach that after you're dead, that if you do a good deed, then uh, you get angel's wings and a bell will ring because you get to go to heaven. I think that's, uh, that's it's a wonderful life uh, doctrine, okay? That's not, not a Bible doctrine. We do read that when Lazarus died, the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. Okay? So that, that's kind of in there in that song. There is a church in the valley by the Wildwood. I've been there uh, in my work. It carried me across this country. I was driving across Iowa. And uh, I went through one little town. There's little churches out in the country out on the prairie across Iowa. And I wouldn't have called it a veil. A veil's a valley. But out there on the prairie, you just take what you get. And so it dipped down a little bit and it came back up and they called that a valley. And that was good. But right down at the bottom of there, that there was this little brown church. And there was a sign, like a historical marker, the, the church in the wildwood. Well, I drove by and I thought, is that what I thought that said? And I drove back and sure enough, that very little building where they... Uh, that the fellow wanted to write that song, that, that was the church. He's talking, there really is a little brown church in the veil out there. And um, to some people, the, the sentiments of that song about going back to that little church where you were in, in your childhood, that's the way some people are going to feel when they come here next week for Friends and Family Day. You know it. They've got memories of being at Rock Cliff. And it, there's something about being part of a congregation that you never really stop being part of that congregation in sentiment. You just, I can think of about 16 congregations I've been a part of in my life. And I remember those people and think of them. And, and it's almost like going home to go back and see some of those places and Remember that. I hope to see a lot of them someday in heaven. That's, that's what I want. But there'll be a lot of people here that will come. And, and to them, that's the way this is going to be. And here's what I'm going to preach next Sunday. I've already decided it. I had not got it all worked out. But we, we usually start with a psalm. Well, I'll do the 20th psalm after we have our meal and do that for the afternoon service. For the morning service. I want to talk about some things that haven't changed here. Now they'll come back and they're going to see different people. They'll see different colors and different lights and, and the stairways and different things. It's not the same. Uh, it's, it's very familiar, but it won't be exactly the same. But there are some things that haven't changed here. And those are going to be the spiritual things. And that's what I'll just let go down to a list. Some of those things that, that don't change at Rock Cliff and why they don't change. So that's going to be the lesson. Invite your friends, make sure your family knows, make sure your friends know, and we'll just have a wonderful day together. And in a little, a little way, a little way, you think how it's going to be to get to heaven when we meet with our friends and family in Christ together and enjoy that time together. So, uh, Let's have a good day of that next week. Now, I'm going to go over the material that we get from house to house, heart to heart this morning. So this is not a normal sermon. I'm usually preaching right from a text. But I like doing this. Uh, Alan Webster doesn't preach the way I do. He preaches the same things, 
But he does them different. He puts them up in these tracks. And I don't want you to just hear the way I do it all the time. I want you to hear how others do it. And Alan does such a good job in explaining Bible truths in the way he does. And so he writes these tracks, and we get a box of them. We've got 15 of them. I probably won't cover them all very well this morning, but I'll let you know what's there, and I'm going to put them on the track rack. And this first one's real good for what we're coming to. Um, who was it that sang that song here at Garth Brooks? I've got friends in low places. You remember that song? Uh, um, one of those country music songs. That's the name of this track. I've got friends in low places. And we do. And some of them are in low places they don't need to be in. I thought, how appropriate for Friends and Family Day to just start with this track. i got friends in the low place of sin. I mean, they are captive to sin. And they don't need to stay there, do they? I've got friends in the low place. He calls it backsliding. They just quit coming to church. They know better than that. And I've got friends that are there. I've got some good friends that are good people. And they get in the low place of discouragement. Now, everybody going to go through that in their life. I mean, if, if every day was a wonderful day, we wouldn't really be living in reality, would we? And so there's times, and sometimes when you get down here, you think, can I ever get out of this? And we can help them. We lift them up. I tell you, if you ever get discouraged, you will. And when you do, just say, that's when I'm going to make sure I go to church. I mean, you've got friends that will help you. And you'll, you'll come through it. You'll come through it. But I've got friends there. And the, the worst thing is, I've got, I've got friends in hell. And I don't want any more friends there. So we want to help people. Invite your friends, see? Invite your friends. And let's help them live that life. And show them what it is. And Friends and Family Day is just that's one of the reasons we do Friends and Family Day. What a good excuse to invite someone to come to church. Now you can say, uh, we ought to invite them all the time, every Sunday. But special events like this kind of give us an excuse to say, we've got Friends and Family Day next Sunday. And when the preacher was up there talking about that, I thought about you because you're my friend. And I just want to make sure you know you're invited to be with us that Sunday. See how easy that is? And if someone said that to you, you wouldn't feel offended. You wouldn't feel, oh boy, they just keep pushing the church. No, you, you, I'm glad they count me as their friend. And, and they might come. And even if they don't, we'll be sending the light out by doing that, won't we? So let's take advantage of that time. This is the publication that we've sent out. How many of you all, just show of hands, do you receive this in the mail? Let me see the number of you that receive it in the mail. We're sending it to three mailing zones. And uh, the, it, it's all up and down from Biola into McMinnville. And some of us live outside of that zone. It's kind of a narrow zone, but it is up and down this highway where people are past the building. And I'm glad to see that many of you are receiving it. I want to, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. What, what if I said, how many of y'all read it when you got it? Don't show me your hand. I'm not, I'm not going to look. But, uh, but, but do that. And, and use it as a chance, because if you get it, your neighbor probably gets it. See? And, and think, when you get it, think, okay, this is what my neighbor got in the mail. Let's see. I'm going to see what they got. And then, it might be, through the week, a chance to come up where you can say, did you get that house to house? In the, what did you think? Did you see that part where it said, and, and, and call their attention to it, and try to capitalize on this as a chance to... Uh, to open that discussion and send the light out, like we say, send the light out. This one is uh, 
Ten things that I wish the world knew about Jesus. Um, religion today in our culture, a lot of people talk about religion. You know, it's, it's kind of like, stay away from that. Stay away from this. Uh, I know people that I can walk to from right here and be there in just a few minutes. And they know I'm the preacher here. And as soon as they see me coming, they're kind of... It's not me. It's not me, because I've always been nice to them. It's not me. It's uh, the very fact that it's religion. It's not even that it's the, the Church of Christ. There's some people that just don't like the Church of Christ. It's not that. A lot of them, it's just religion, period. I don't have anything to do with it. The gospel is good news. And what they have heard and what they have learned about religion is not good. Well, I wish they knew these ten things. Here's ten things I wish people knew about Jesus. Jesus does not want to condemn you. He wants to save you. I'm not coming to this world to condemn the world, but to save the world, Jesus says. That's what they need to know about Jesus. They need to know that uh, Jesus is the answer to man's problem that is sin. That gets to the root of all our problems, doesn't it? I mean, there's little difficulties in life along the way that may not be directly associated with sin, but the real problems we got go back to sin. And Jesus is the, the, the way to deal with those problems and see what Jesus is the Son of God. Number three, Jesus is one of us. Number four, He knows. He knows how it is to be weary and thirsty. And he knows how it is to weep. And he knows how it is to enjoy his company and to, uh, to eat good food. And he knows all these things. He's tempted in all points like as we are. He knows. And he understands us better than we understand ourselves. He, one of us... Uh, Jesus was crucified by his own people and they weren't atheists. You know the ones that crucified Jesus were religious people. And just because someone's religious doesn't mean they're righteous, does it? Religious people crucified Jesus. I wish people knew that. Or be reminded of that. Uh, Jesus came back to life. That's what the, that's good news. That was so amazing. Even his own disciples didn't expect it to happen. And he did. He came back to life. Jesus built his church and he wants you to be a member. He loves you, see? He wants you part of his family. It's part of his church. Jesus reigns over the whole world. It says here, except one place, except one place. He doesn't reign in the hearts of those who refuse him. Now you can shut the door. He stands at the door. No, you got to open and let him in. And he reigns over everything. But if you block him out of your heart, that's a place he's not going to reign. Uh, Jesus will judge everyone. Uh, it, it's, it's, I saw a sign, was it this morning? It, it's this lady looking in a mirror. It says, if you're God, let you do anything you want to do, then you're God is you. Well, there's a standard that we're to meet. And Jesus is going to be a judge. But I tell you, Paul said, it's by, by according to my gospel, Jesus is going to be the judge. Who would you rather judge you? Uh, I'm glad my brethren aren't going to judge me. I've been judged by them before, and I didn't like that. And I'm glad my neighbor doesn't judge me. If anyone's going to judge me, I want it to be Jesus. I know no one loves me more or wants me in heaven more. 
But there's a standard. He'll be the judge. And Jesus wants each person to follow him. A physician can save your life. A lawyer can save your business. A financial advisor can save your money. A coach can save your athletic career. A consultant can save your reputation. Jesus can save your soul. Okay, what a good thing then to send to our neighbors and to get that message out. Well, there's a lot more in here. There's a nice little Bible quiz in all of these. There's a story about the song Amazing Grace and uh, several things. But this goes out um, from us to our neighbors. And it's kind of like, uh, well, it's kind of like the, the, the mass bombing, you know. you got to send in the ground troops, and that's us. But we're preparing the soils by this. Now let's take advantage of it and sow some seed in those soils. Also, we got another bookmark, and this is going through the New Testament. And I don't know if you're getting a collection of these or not, but you might want to grab one, see how this works. This one is it's called chapter to chapter, and it's really got on this one the key topics of each chapter and the key verses of each chapter in the New Testament. Now this covers first and second Corinthians, the two letters Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and it's got a little introduction to them. It's kind of like the, the little up introduction you'll read in some study Bibles. You know, a lot of times study Bible introduce the book with a little thing, and then you have the, the book. and the, It's sort of like that, but then the key message and the key verses of each chapter of 1st and 2nd Corinthians in this little bookmark. So it'd be good, you know, just take... First and Second Corinthians, and you're going to read through it. Just start off. I'm going to read all the key verses first, and maybe mark them, and then I'll go back and just read the book and and see how all that fits in. So we got a number of these. If I mention the Battle of Corinth, I bet most of us are thinking about ancient Corinth. You might be thinking of some of those ancient battles like we've been talking about on Wednesday night the, uh, associated with the story of Esther where the Persians were fighting the Greeks and such. If you live in southwest Tennessee or north Mississippi and someone says the Battle of Corinth that was a civil war battle in Corinth, Mississippi and the uh, the Confederates had moved out of there, and the Yankees had moved in, and then the Confederates came in and tried to take it back. They drove them out of town. And then the next day, those Yankees turned around and drove the Confederates back out again. I tell you, it's just it's awful, wasn't it? It talks about how many men were lost in that battle. But there's another battle of Corinth, and it is a spiritual battle. And so this kind of talks about the, the battle of Corinth in Mississippi a little bit in this track. But really it's to lead in and, and to talk about the spiritual battle. The devil had Corinth. Of all the cities of ancient Rome, if someone said, what's the wicked city? That'd be Corinth. Corinth it is the city of great immorality. Paul came to Corinth with fear and trembling. Preached the gospel. Now that's really what this is about. The spiritual battle for Corinth. How the devil was there. How Paul came in by himself and he got some recruits. See, he got some people who obeyed the gospel and they became members of the Lord's church and helped fight that spiritual battle with him and then talks about the Savior's work involved in that. So it's just kind of a good way to talk about the uh, evangelism of the wicked city of Corinth as we read about it in the New Testament. Um, here's a spiritual battle and I guess some ladies fight this battle but we men know we fought this battle. We fought this battle. Uh comes from a passage in the book of Job. A covenant every man ought to make with his eyes. You see, Job, in declaring his righteousness, 
They say, Job, you must have sinned. That's why you're suffering. You must have sinned. One of the things Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? They were accusing Job wrongfully. But it's interesting that Job made a covenant with his eyes. Job was not a victim of what he had seen because he decided he was going to decide what he would see. He got control of that. And it's not just seeing something, no, it's not that. It has to do with the desire, doesn't it? That's what, when you're talking about a covenant with your eyes, why should I look upon a maid? Kind of like, look not thou upon the wine. That doesn't mean you don't see it. Don't desire it. And a lot of times that problem we face, men, comes from what we see is where it starts, doesn't it? And then we look. And then our minds can dwell. And uh, the pornography industry knows this and makes just millions and millions off of this. But you see, the thing is, we can control what we see. You remember what Jesus said? If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Now that's not literal because you could... You could uh, you can lust with your left eye just like you can with your right eye. That's not what he's talking about. But he's talking about how important it is. You can, don't, you're not a victim of this. You can decide. So make a covenant with your eyes. And fighting that trip. That's the best way to start. You don't want to get involved in that kind of stuff. Start right there. I'm not even, I'm not going to look at it. Uh, if you have to, look away. Okay? And so make a covenant with your eyes. Another one about a spiritual battle. Who's missing out? Who, have you ever felt like that? Boy, I'm going to miss out. I've heard people talk about, oh, but if, uh, if, if my son or daughter doesn't go to the prom, they're going to be missing out. You ever heard that? They're going to miss out. And, and there's all kind of folks. Oh, man, come on. This, is, this, this drink will make you feel good. Or this drug will make you feel good. We have good parties. You're missing out. And people think, boy, am I missing something that I ought to be enjoying in this life? Now, the Bible talks about the pleasures of sin for a season. It'd be good to miss out on some of that. But who's really missing out? Uh, the one that's missing out is a sinner that doesn't have Christ. They're missing out. They, they, they don't understand how good it is and what they're missing. A sinner without citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, they're the ones that are missing out. The, uh, uh, the sinner doesn't have the promise and doesn't have the hope. And they're without God. Uh, the Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Oh, I see these people. I just think, my, what, what awful things they have brought upon themselves because of their sin. And they're missing out. They're missing it. And so it's a track on that spiritual battle. Here's one I wish everybody could take home with them. There's one, two, three, four. It's only five. And if they're all gone, I might order more. Here's one to just stick in your Bible. And if you're ever in that low place of discouragement or know someone, here's a good one right here. Five pictures of hope. That's the name of the track. Five pictures. Hope is a light. To help us see through the darkness of sin. Hope is a nail to hold things together when everything looks like it's falling apart. Hope is a doorway out of despair. Hope is a helmet to shield us from the blows of life. And hope is an anchor to hold us in place in life's storms. 
the book of Romans chapter 8, Paul says, we are saved by hope. Now all of this has the scripture references to describe how that's the pictures that God gives us of what hope can do for us. It's a good one to pull out anytime you, you're starting to feel a little hopeless. Pull that out. We've got hope. I mean, what about those who are missing out on this? They don't have hope. They're missing out. We've got hope. So what a beautiful, encouraging track. Uh, do I really matter? Do I really matter is the name of this track. Sometimes that's where you get. You get down where you think, well, maybe I just don't matter. And that's a pitiful feeling to hell. Well, it talks about here about why you matter and what the, what the cost, how much you cost. <laughs> you know, things are costly matter, don't they? Okay, there's a manufacturing cost. I've been fearfully and wonderfully made. There's a purchase price. The blood of Christ is a purchase price. You don't think you matter? What about the blood of Christ that was shed for you? God thought you mattered. And uh, it's got some other costs. The uh, invested cost. God wants you to grow. He's, he, he's written a whole book here to help show you how to do it. He's put a lot of investment in you. You matter. There's an investment here. And then there's the... Uh, idea of a servant's viewpoint. You can matter if you'll be a service to others. What you can matter to God and to others by way of your service and then looking at it from the biblical perspective. So yes, we matter. Every single person matters. Everyone is important. And so uh, we matter. I matter. Everyone, of, everyone you know matters and that includes yourself. So it really puts the importance on us. Uh, the weeping preacher. The weeping preacher. If you might think about the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. He's often called the weeping prophet. Well, this is not about Jeremiah. I'm going to run out of time. Uh, I have to skip through these. You'll just have to get the tracks and read them, okay? Because I'm not going to spend another week at this. Uh, Paul is the weeping preacher. Think how many times you read about Paul weeping in the New Testament. He wept over the spiritual condition of his nation. Uh, he cried when he wrote letters. He talks in 2 Corinthians about how he had written to them earlier with tears. Now, I want you to imagine now you got, you're reading 1 Corinthians. The, the church received this letter from Paul, 1 Corinthians, trying to read that and look, say, so, wait, well, I can't, that word didn't come out, it's kind of smudged. What are these spots all over this letter? You get 2 Corinthians now, read that. I wrote that first letter with tears. That's how Paul, he was stern in 1 Corinthians, but he was weeping while he wrote. Okay? Paul cried when he preached. I did hear, you know, sometime I'll do that. You know I do that. I heard about a preacher who said, I don't cry when I preach. And uh, he had great control of his emotions. He said, I went to one preacher. He'd send him, he'd cry and cry. He'd, and then he'd just shut it right off. And go on preaching. And then he'd cry again shut it off. Go for it. How's he do that? How's he turn that off and on? And then I got his sermon outline. And all over it said, cry here, cry here, cry here. <laughs> now, if I get up and weep up here, I don't have it in my notes to, to cry. If I'm an emotional person, and uh, sometimes I have to contain myself. But Paul did. I don't mind crying when I preach. Paul talked about how he was weeping in his preaching. I warned everyone night and day with tears, he said. And Paul wept when he thought on his enemies and when the gospel was hindered. And when he saw his friends going through trials. So the weeping preacher. There's a little biography of Saul. I won't go into this one here. We've had this before. A little track kind of outlining Paul's life here. The omni-god. Omni. When you think of omni, that word means everything. That's what we're talking about. And so he is, uh, we talk about omnipotent, all-powerful. Okay? We talk about omniscient. That means all-knowing. And then we'll use this word omnipresent. He's always everywhere. And then here's the one we don't use much. 
omni-loving. God is love. It's so much a trait of who God is. You know, he just personifies love. God does. He doesn't say love is God. No, but God is love. Omni-love. He's also omni-fair and impartial. And he's also omni good and omni severe. Behold the goodness and severity of God. So God is everything. The omni God. Here's one titled Make Jesus Your Banker. <laughs> well, um, y'all know about banking. You, you might enjoy this track. It's uh, kind of an, another analogy he draws here. But you see, you need to open an account. It's risk-free investment, and it's got high interest, and there's club benefits, but there's no diversification. No, you got you got to put all your money right here, okay? And um, and then there's the maturation period, and that talks about, of course, when we die and receive the reward at the end, which is great, great. So just an analogy. If you're ever going to make a uh, talk at the web house or, or extend the invitation or something, little analogies like this are good to use, and you could use a track for something like that. Another one, how to have a great spiritual retirement. Similar thing. Uh, here's one. Has paternity ever been determined in the Bethlehem case? Okay, we know his mother was Mary. Who was his father? Who was his father? And this just goes down through the evidence of who his father was. Some thought it was Joseph. Well, Joseph. Or Mary was with Zacharias and Elizabeth. Well, Joseph. Some say the Roman soldier. You don't read anything about a Roman soldier in there. Who, who was his father? And then the evidence provided he was born of a virgin. He's the only begotten son of God. How do you determine the paternity case in Bethlehem? Who was the father? Well, it's a good track on evidences here. And then this last one. Does it make any difference which church I attend? Uh, there's an analogy here. Say you want to go to a ball game. Your, your favorite team is going to play the team you hate the most. And it's going to be a close one. And boy, you get to go. And you got your tickets. And you've cleared everything out of your schedule. And maybe you bought some special clothes. So you, everybody know who you're for. You know, you got the clothes and, and everything. And you've got it all ready. And now you're going to the game. You think it makes any difference what uh, stadium you go to? It doesn't make any difference what state. They're all playing game. Yeah, but that, that's not the game. I, no, it doesn't make any difference. How foolish. Why would people say it doesn't make any difference what church you go to? Um, people say, go to the church of your choice. And in this track, it goes through Robert Taylor. <laughs> he took this right from Robert Taylor, and he gave him credit. By the way, <clears throat> Robert Taylor is going to hold a gospel meeting at Morrison. It's the same time that B.J. Clark's holding a gospel meeting at uh, Bobby. What a great week that's going to be. And I'll be torn betwixt the two, you know. <laughs> okay, but, but Robert Taylor, he, but part of the, he goes through every book of the New Testament. He says, you don't find in that book where Jesus said ever go to the church of your choice. That was never taught by the Holy Spirit. That's what people, that's what men say. Men will say all kind of things, won't they? That's what men say. What does God say? Well, Jesus came and established his church. Now, there's nothing anyone can do that's going to beat that. That's the church you want to be part of. And Jesus tells you that you don't go join this church. No. <laughs> Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he'll add you to his church. He's going to count you as one of his. And so, do you believe? Then repent. 
and confess his name before men and be baptized into Jesus Christ. And he'll make sure you're in the right church. And so, a track on the distinctiveness of the Lord's church. That's a lot of material, isn't it? I'm going to go put it out on the track rack and rearrange those after we extend the invitation. But uh, if you need to respond, then do it as we stand and sing the invitation song.